let's welcome Martin Zirnbauer for his uh, uh, seminar on um, localization. And I didn't see the exact title yet. So, well, he will show us uh, soon. And um, we're very happy to have you to have you talk uh, to us uh, today. Please, Martin. Okay, I, I'm sharing the screen as far as I know. Yes. Good. And um, I want to begin by thanking but... the organizers of this program to invite me to participate and also to speak here and give the seminar. The topic of the program is not exactly my field of research. And I think I'm unlikely to turn into a numerical boot camper, but I'm still keen to learn. And uh, anyway, uh, it's my experience that good things may happen when people from different communities engage in discussion. So in that spirit, um, I'm giving this talk, but it won't be exactly uh, what I announced originally, which was 10 days ago. Um, I've reorganized my talk so as to, I hope, better cater to the interests of this audience and to facilitate uh, discussions. It's based on a couple of papers from a few years back. And in, in trying this, I noticed that if I follow this file, um, I get constrained by the oversize of the first slide. So I'm going to switch to a different <clears throat> set of slides. And again, I think I need to share this. Um, Okay, let me share. Does everybody see my first slide integer quantum hall effect? Well, we just see your beautiful screen background. Oh, that's not good. Somewhere in Death Valley, maybe. Or... So let me try again. Yeah, this is fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we we get going. The um, that is the canonical first slide to make sure that everybody has an idea of what we are talking about. The integer quantum Hall effect is one of the major discoveries of condensed matter physics. It dates uh, forty. <clears throat> to 1980, 40 years ago. Uh, it is observed in semiconductor heterostructures at uh, low temperatures of the order of one Kelvin or below, and in very strong magnetic fields of the order of 10 Tesla or more. Under these situations, <clears throat> Experimentalists observe an exact quantization of, now it depends, uh, sometimes they plot the whole resistivity. As a theorist, I prefer to think about the whole conductance, which is quantized as an integer. And while that may not be surprising <clears throat> initially, People were surprised because this holds true in very, very dirty samples. Now, for the purposes of this talk, we want a lot of dirt because we're going to ignore electron-electron interactions, <clears throat> not a Coulomb interaction, and that's justified if the biggest scale in the system is set by the disorder, not by the uh, Coulomb interaction. <clears throat> so very dirty systems, 
exhibit this exact quantization. The origin for this is topological. The first one to understand it was David Fowler's, and he received the Nobel Prize or one third of the Nobel Prize 2016 for this brilliant understanding. Now, as we vary the magnetic field, as the experimentalist varies the magnetic field, he or she will observe a transition from one quantized plateau to the neighboring plateau, or say from the first plateau to the, uh, to the trivial one. And that transition is a critical phenomenon and by general principles well known to this audience, it should be <clears throat> described or the, the scaling limit thereof should be described by a conformal field theory. Now, <clears throat> uh, uh, Martin, but where does the transition start or end? Like which part of this plot, uh, on which part of this curve the, the field conformal field theory should apply? Exactly in the middle. Okay. So where the, the whole conductivity, if it goes from a whole conductance, if it goes from zero to one, we want to be, we want to sit on the point where it's exactly one half. So the CFT, the, the pure unperturbed CFT only holds at that very point. But as you understand, if we understand the, the CFT, hopefully we can perturb around it and develop a theory that is interest, interesting for the people in, that do the phenomenology, not just the exact critical point, but also its vicinity. vicinity. Okay, that was my first slide. Then here is a new slide, which I made yesterday, uh, motivated by uh, the speech given by Ilya Grossberg. Um, there's a new development in the general area. Traditionally, Anderson transitions were thought to be transitions between a metallic state and, ins and an insulator state. More recently, it was understood that the integer quantum Hall transitions has a number of cousins Turns out that there are, in fact, in any dimension, that's an insight by the uh, group in uh, the UCSB with senior member uh, Andreas Ludwig. They first understood that in any dimension, including 2D, 3D, you have five so-called strong topological insulators. And when you tune out of this, strong topological insulator phase into a neighboring phase, maybe the trivial phase, or one with a, a different topological quantum number, then you again have a critical phenomenon. And we all expect, or the experts will expect that these are governed by conformal field theories. So here uh, I'm listing the integer quantum all case. Um, to name a few others, there is the Majorana superconductor, first pointed out by uh, Reed and Green. There is the quantum spin hole insulator, um, which going to three dimensions also exists there, where it's known as the Z2 strong topological insulator associated with the names of Fouquet Melli. In three dimensions, you have helium three in the B phase. That's a topological superfluid. <clears throat> and you have more, uh, some of them come from um, particle hole symmetry being a, a symmetry of the system. So this is to say that <clears throat> there are many examples of interest. <clears throat> Ilya already mentioned. Um, so there, there are many CFTs uh, to discover, uh, not just in 3D, also in 2D. Fact is that the only uh, CFT for these transitions that, that we are beginning to understand 
is that for the integer quantum Hall case. And that's what my talk today will be about for the most part. But actually I try to keep things fairly general. Can I ask a question about this other CFTs on the right side of this slide? Are they, do they all involve disorder or are they, are they not? Yeah, yeah. Here, so here I'm talking strong, that's jargon. Strong means these phases are robust with respect to disorder. Yeah, so if you have weak disorder, all kinds of other possibilities arise. People speak about crystalline topological insulators. Um, here, our interest is in, in a lot of disorder and in those phases that survive the presence of strong disorder. I'm just curious. Usually people say that in helium, there is no disorder because it's just all disorder yeah. just falls into So there is no disorder, but as a theorist, you can imagine throwing in disorder and the theoretical prediction is that this particular phase will not go away. It, it, it would be stable. Okay. okay. Can you say what these letters for the symmetry classes refer to? Well, it's called the Atlant, believe it or not, it's called the Atlant Zirnbauer classification scheme. The, that's something I invented in 1996. Originally, there were the Wigner Dyson classes. They were called unitary, orthogonal, and symplectic. And then we discovered that there were more classes of a similar kind, <clears throat> total of 10. And um, after some fooling around with um, possibilities, like uh, I wrote a paper with Altland where we introduced the symplecton, uh, <clears throat> we decided that we needed to have something new. And I decided to pick the Cartan notation for Lie groups and, and symmetric spaces um, to give us the symbol for these cases. Uh, so, the experts will know that in the Cartan classification of symmetric spaces, you have exceptional um, spaces, but then you have large families, uh, 10 of them, and these are the, and then Cartan has letters for them. So A is the, uh, the unitary or, the, or the, the GL series, the A series, and integer quantum all case is named, named after them and correspondingly the others. Is that an answer? Okay. Yes no? Yeah. Okay. Maybe another quick question. Uh, what's the shoe shui for ego modal in 3D? I mean, I'm aware there's a one dimensional. Well, for ego this should be in quotes. So th there are analogs thereof. The main thing is there should be a particle hole symmetry or a in, in second quantization or <clears throat> equivalently a chiral or sublattice symmetry in the first quantized uh, Hamilton. You know? uh, that's the way to realize A3. <clears throat> okay, so here's what, what I try to do. Um, if you're gonna understand anything about um, Anderson transitions, um, we first need to appreciate the role played by hyperbolic symmetry. <clears throat> so I spend quite a few slides on that topic. Then I will give a brief summary, summa, summary of the CFT for integer quantum hall. Um, there will only be two slides because I want to have some time remaining for a discussion of things that I feel are particularly interesting to our audience today. Okay, so the next 20, 25 minutes, I'll be speaking about hyperbolic symmetry. I'll take off from where we were led by Ilya. So I remind you that this is a story about Green's functions, about single particle Green's functions, because they encode the information that we seek, information about critical wave functions, about conductivities, things that are physically observable. Um, the matrix element of the resolvent operator, which is what the Green's function is, um, needs to have 
an imaginary increment to the energy, which can be positive or negative. Uh, in one case, we speak of the retarded, in the other case of the advanced Green's function. What we do is we write this as a Gaussian integral of a complex bosonic field with a quadratic form <clears throat> that is the object to be inverted in constructing the resolvent operator. Now by normalization of a Gaussian integral, there's a determinant <clears throat> as a factor in front, that determinant we write as a corresponding integral over fermions, fermionic ghost, in the style of Fadiev Popov, who did something like this in the uh, for the gauge fixing in non-abelian gauge theories. Now, depending on what we're after, we do this not just once, but a number of times. <clears throat> so we, we may introduce a number of copies of this field. Uh, the number of copies will depend on how many Green's functions um, we need to express a given observable of interest. We might be interested in uh, several energies. Some people like to study energy level correlation functions. <clears throat> so if so, you will need more copies. Um, in my later discussion, I will often specialize, I, I try to be pedagogical and not flood you with uh, complexity that's not really necessary for a first introduction. So often I will set R to one, but remember R can, is in principle any positive integer. Now, Wigner hyperbolic symmetry arises because you're forced by the nature of retarded and advanced Green's functions, you're forced to put a signature <clears throat> in this exponent, plus minus. That's forced because you have this thing here and um, the exponent for the most part, so neglecting epsilon is imaginary. So that's an oscillatory integral, which, <clears throat> needs a little bit of help to converge and a little bit of help comes from the small epsilon. So epsilon is an infinitesimal. When we set it, send it to zero, then <clears throat> putting factors together, also including the fermions, <coughs> we encounter a sesquilinear form. Yeah? So bar in this talk means complex conjugate. Um, and um, that form is built into the basic, the initial integral on which the entire formalism is based. And we need to be aware of the symmetry group, of the group leaving this sesqui linear form invariant. That's a Lie supergroup because we have uh, bosonic and uh, fermionic fields. The phi's are the bosons and the psi's are the fermions. And in the particular instance of the integer quantum Hall case, or more generally a system of symmetry class A, that global symmetry group is a unitary or <clears throat> uh, Lie supergroup and are denoted by curly u. Um, so when you change the symmetry, this group will change. It may become, uh, go into the orthogonal family or into in the symplectic family. Actually, in the super case, it will usually be orthosymplectic because we need to combine bosons and fermions in a, in a reasonable way. Um, but the, the point is that the non-compactness is always there with very few exceptions. Uh, so there's a, a famous case associated with the name of Ilya and, uh, and I guess Reed and, uh, and Ludwig 
who um, pointed out that in class C, if you take the smallest number of copies, namely R equal to one, then you have something that's related to uh, critical per per to percolation. In that case, you don't have that um, hyperbolic sector, but that's an exception. And um, it's not one that I'll be focusing on. <clears throat> okay, a question that came up. So here's a new slide that I also wrote yesterday. Question came up about the upper critical dimension. So let me try to some, say something uh, helpful, hopefully helpful about the issue of upper critical dimension. So putting formulas on the previous slide together, we get an expression for the local density of states, uh, which is the discontinuity across the real energy axis of the Green's function normalized suitably. And then this E symbol here always means the expectation value over with respect to the disorder. So it's the dis, disorder average. So bar here is always complex conju conjugation. When I want to <clears throat> bring out the operation of taking disorder average, I write expectation value. So this is the disorder average local density of states. And by using the combining the formulas on the previous slide, we write it as a field integral um, where under the integration below the exponential and under the integration sign, we have phi minus squared plus phi plus squared taken at X, which is the position on the diagonal for our Green's function. That's a positive quantity. Well, it could be zero, it's certainly never negative. And here I wrote out the Lagrangian um, that has to be integrated and goes into the exponent for the field theory integral that is denoted by these angular brackets. Um, so <coughs> yeah, I'm making the assumption that the kinetic energy in the, the Hamiltonian, so I'm, um, I'm sticking to Ilya's uh, notations and conventions. The Hamiltonian is, is the sum of a kinetic energy, which I'm modeling by Laplacian or, or negative Laplacian, and a random potential. Averaging over the random potential gives us this nonlinear term. Lambda squared is the strength, it's the variance of the disorder potential, which for simplicity we assume to be Gaussian distributed, which just gives us this quotic interaction. <clears throat> and the, um, the sort of the, the free part or quadratic part um, uh, sitting here in front. And the thing that needs to be emphasized is the hyperbolic symmetry. You know? So the, the part re relating to the retarded sector comes with a minus i and the part relating to the advanced sector with plus i. And notice that I omitted epsilon, but we know that epsilon is there to regularize. And I also skipped the fermions. <clears throat> I didn't want to clutter the notation too much. Um, so we all understand that uh, need to add in the fermions um, for the full Lagrangian. <clears throat> so that's what we are up against. <clears throat> and we now will ask, um, what happens to this when we renormalize? And in particular, <clears throat> to address the question of upper critical dimension, we would like to know, is there some high enough dimension where this can be treated in mean field <clears throat> uh, following the style of Landa? Well, there are question marks here. <clears throat> to get some idea, I drew for you a picture of an orbit. Yeah, so the symmetry group is whatever it was. <clears throat> I'm focusing on the important part, 
namely the so-called bosonic or non-compact sector. And I'm going to S U because the U without the S, uh, it makes no difference. And then it's a little bit easier to draw and think. <clears throat> and here is a picture of a typical orbit of the symmetry group. <clears throat> On the vertical axis, I'm plotting the quantity that goes here for <clears throat> the local density of states. I'm denote, I'm abbreviated by X3. Um, but then I'm also plotting on two other axes, the real part of phi plus conjugate phi minus and the imaginary part of the same thing. <clears throat> so that's three degrees of freedom. There's a fourth one, which is just a, the overall phase but that one is not important and I'm, I'm <clears throat> suppressing it. So now things fit nicely into a in three dimensional space. And I've drawn for you here a, a level, uh, level surface of the function <clears throat> that figures here in our Lagrangian, and it's also in the quadratic piece. Yeah? So the, this, this characteristic quantity, the difference between something squared in the retarded sector and uh, the same thing squared in the advanced sector. Mm. So the orange surface is a surface of fixed invariant um, combination here. And, um, and that's what it is. And now we should compare this a little bit with the, what we have. We contrast this with the situation that we have when the symmetry is compact. In that case, uh, this minus would be plus. Uh, this plus would be minus. Instead of the hyperboloid, we would have a sphere. And then in particular, there would be a lot of meaning to the origin in, in this picture. <clears throat> because, um, well, let's start at the beginning. Let's uh, recall that when we uh, have low temperature and we are above the lower critical dimension, um, then a spontaneous symmetry breaking will occur. The field, say in, in three dimensions for the O3 model or something, will <clears throat> spontaneously break symmetry. It will localize at some point on, on the sphere. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so that's a long story. Now, if we go above the transition temperature, the, the high temperature, it may happen <clears throat> if we are in, in high enough dimension that this term goes away under renormalization and the, the transition is <clears throat> the critical properties of the tr transition are mean field type and are given by Landau theory. And an important role in that Landau description is played by zero. In the high temperature limit, the, the field will just fluctuate weakly around zero. <clears throat> um, the symmetry is unbroken, and, and that's what happens. Now, this cannot happen here. So if, if the high temperature phase, where the one where the field localized at zero, then that high temperature phase would have zero local density of states. Yeah? So that's the importance of this formula, phi equal to zero means you have zero density of states. Now that can happen and it's not entirely without interest. You might actually decide that this is worth studying. You could, um, you could look so that, but that would be called a band edge singularity. It would be called a study of the critical behavior of the density of states. And that could be rather similar to what you are used to. 
but we are concerned with Anderson transitions where the critical behavior is not in the local density of states. It's something else that happens. <clears throat> it's something uh, that has to do with this hyperbolic structure. And uh, the important role is not played by phi equal to zero. And so you should now get very skeptical about applicability of your intuition from the mean field scenario for compact symmetry. So as a warning here, the story is different. It's a, uh, <clears throat> it would now be a lot to say, but let me just stop here. So this was just a, a teaser or a, a warning that you should not, um, so some things have to be rethought. Can I ask a question? Yes. So, so you said that for high temperature, this cannot work, but what about the low temperature? Can I think that at low temperature, there is spontaneous symmetry breaking? Yes. And that would be rather similar to what, what you're used to. Yeah. But then as I lower the temperature, what happens? This order parameter doesn't go to zero? What's... Well, if you a little bit patient, of course, I'd be speaking okay. about that. It's a lot. okay. It's okay. Uh, Thanks. So if yeah. if you are still set, dissatisfied later on, please come back to this question. But I think no, I'm very, I'm very satisfied. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So next slide: systems with a large local density of states. So here is the same formula as before, written in a slightly different way. Um, when the local density states is large, one can derive nonlinear sigma model. Uh, Ilya gave you some idea of how that works. Um, and uh, to save time, I will not revisit. Uh, I will just say that in that case, the target space is a coset. <clears throat> of our symmetry group, I wrote it again here, quotient by a subgroup, uh, calling it K. And K is, is the, the group that only mixes retarded with retarded and advanced with advanced. <clears throat> that symmetry is unbroken. Um, and um, so, uh, that's what you divide out <clears throat> as an expression for the, the field <clears throat> denoted by Q. Um, you get the, so this is now the formula for this picture here. That was the geometric picture. Now here is the analytic analytical formula. You, there's a special matrix, <clears throat> um, often called lambda, I'm writing sigma three because it is Pauli sigma three tensored with the identity. You conjugate that by elements in the symmetry group. And in this way you get uh, an adjoint orbit of the symmetry group. Uh, the points on this orbit have the property that is squared to the identity. And so these things have been understood for 40 years or close to 40 years. And they lead to the conventional scenario of Anderson transition in the metallic state <clears throat> where states are extended, the symmetry U, <clears throat> which acts transitively on the target space is broken spontaneously in the insulator phase symmetry is restored. <clears throat> so to make this a little bit more concrete, when you do a real life system, um, you have this epsilon in the game, or you have an absorbing boundary, and either one of these will try to or favor configurations of the field that are near this point. So that's so an absorbing boundary uh, breaks the symmetry, <clears throat> like an external magnetic field breaks the isotropy for a, 
this, the um, Euclidean space isotropy for, uh, for a magnet. And uh, symmetry restoration or unbroken symmetry means that the field fluctuates strongly on this hyperboloid so strongly that the symmetry is restored. If you go away from the absorbing boundary or if you take epsilon to zero, the field will fluctuate all over the place. It will fill the entire hyperbolic space. Symmetry restoration. Expansion in- Martin, I'm sorry, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so, okay, I, um, this symmetry restoration, it happens for the first time when you go to the phase transition, I imagine. When you have a phase transition, you have a CFT and that CFT has a restored symmetry. Is this what you have in mind? Yes. But then so, if I go beyond phase transition to the high temperature phase, uh, and so I'm no longer at the CFT, shouldn't I get some simplification of infrared physics? Yes. What is that simple theory? Because you said that uh, I should not take uh, just free fields as a simple theory, but is there some other simple theory? Well, it's not going to be very simple. It's, um, and in fact, I want to challenge the traditional view. So maybe I don't want to explain at great length what is the traditional view. I, I'm, okay. I have a proposal to make. Okay. So unfortunately, the, the theory on the other side um, is not that simple. Okay. Even, even if you go to high dimension, yeah, um, where normally you would exp expect simplification. That, that's, the, that's the traditional uh, wisdom. But now, <clears throat> Um, the traditional wisdom is you don't have an upper critical dimension. But now let me pour some water into the wine. <clears throat> let me turn attention to systems with a small density of states. In that case, let, let me warn you, the conventional sigma model cannot be derived. So the question is, well, what now? <clears throat> if we can't derive conventional sigma model, what can we derive? Well, this story <clears throat> is unfortunately still in its infancy. And <clears throat> my intuition comes from having worked for many years on the integer quantum Hall transition and for finally understanding something about it. But for the moment, let me phrase the message in more general language. So that, this, that's why this is in square brackets. Um, I'm just telling you, I'm drawing my intuition from a case that I understand. But I believe that that intuition applies more generally. The intuition is this. <clears throat> small density of states is more or less the same as strong disorder. When I say small local density states, I mean that the, the number of states that you have inside a coherence volume. So, you know, there's, there's something called the elastic mean free path and, and make a box of the size elastic mean free path and ask how many quantum states are in there. And small density states will be, the, there is one, you know? not 10 to the six, not 10 to the three, but one. <clears throat> so that's the, <clears throat> and that's achieved by going to strong disorder, making the elastic mean three path shorter and shorter. So what do we expect at strong disorder? Well, go, to, go back to an earlier formula. When the, um, so where was it? Uh, here, this one. So when the disorder, is very strong when this variance lambda is big, then you're forcing this combination to be zero. Yeah? When it goes away from zero, you have exponential suppression of the weight. So 
the, the hyperbolic orbit that will matter is not the one I'm showing here. It's in fact, the light cone. It's the one that looks like this. I'll draw a picture of it later. So <clears throat> the focus goes away from these hyperboloids with positive invariant mass to the light cone of a sort of the zero mass um, case. Um, so for strong disorder, the field wants to be on the light cone, or what I call the light cone in, in apostrophes. Um, and now there's some technicalities um, to keep the formula simple. What I do is I change the basis so that the thing denoted by sigma three before becomes sigma two. So that's, that's actually just a unit, unitary change of basis. In the new basis, the Q will look like this. You see the Q of before quit squared to one. Our new Q squares to zero. So in a, in a, re, in a good, well-chosen basis, it looks like this. Um, so there's a special element. You can say this comes by deforming I sigma two. I sigma two would have plus one on the right upper block and minus one on the left lower block. And that minus one has been pushed down to zero. That's sort of the deformation process that takes you from the earlier hyperboloid that I showed initially to the light cone. <clears throat> and then by conjugating that special element with all of the elements of the symmetry, forming again an adjoint orbit, you get you get Q. <clears throat> and then maybe that's not so important. Uh, there's many ways of parametrizing. One of them is by uh, elements from, of a nilpotent group, and then and by elements taken from a, a, a group of block diagonal matrices. Notice that. M appears here, M will um, reappear later as the Vesomino Witten field in the CFT for the integer quantum ball transition. So geometric picture, the picture on the left, I've shown you before, that is the appropriate picture when the local density of states is large. So that's rho, so we have a large offset here, a large mass comparing with, with relativity. Um, that's for large density of states, but I want to think about the case of a small local density of states. In that case, the target <clears throat> is the light cone. So let's take a top view of this. When we look from the top and um, scale so that infinity becomes visible as the boundary of Poincare disk, then it looks like this. You know? So sigma three uh, went here and sigma one went there. <clears throat> so we, without, <clears throat> so I should say that, um, I'm changing notation a little bit. I'm using the fact that the Lie algebra of SU11 is isomorphic to SL2R. In fact, if you do this change of basis going from sigma three to sigma two, you're doing exactly this isomorphism between these two groups of Lie algebras. So I'm now using SL2R notation. SL2R has three generators. They are the real, traceless two by two matrices, uh, which figure here as the, uh, the legends of the three axes. For these- Martin, can I ask a question? Yeah, sorry. Yes. So is it correct to think that this raw uh, on the left-hand side, on the left-hand side picture is the parameter that I tune to reach the phase transition? 
tuning the temperature is kind of equivalent to tuning this, uh, tuning the, not the temperature, tuning the, yes. the magnetic field is equivalent to tuning this rod. Yes, that's correct. Um, but then on, yeah. And but the, then the, the transition, the, the traditional view is that as you, so coming from the low temperature phase or corresponding to metallic behavior, you going down here. Yeah. And then the traditional view is that at rho of the order of unity, I mean, it now depends. Um, um, in, in, in 3D, yeah? So in, 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 in two plus epsilon, the, um, that will happen high up here and, and you have a good expansion because you, you have good control on, uh, on the theory. <clears throat> but now in, in three dimensions, which is what certainly experimentalists are interested, uh, the transition will happen there's something called the Joffe Regel criterion um, at a very small row. And the traditional belief is, belief is that you can still use the nonlinear sigma model that's in the books. Okay. But for the quantum Hall case, I'm claiming that's not so. But the scenario is different there because we don't have metallic states. So we can't approach the transition in that way. So it's, it's kind of, complicated uh, so let me <clears throat> but i'm just worried that on the right hand side once you went to this high high limit you don't have anything to tune so how are you going to reach the transition because now everything is scaled out so it's like it looks like there is no perfect parameter to tune yeah so the, you have to go in a different way <laughs> okay there's extra Thanks. degrees of freedom that you don't see here okay um so the top view of this is the Poincaré disk. And I use coordinates x1, x2, x3 for the, these three axes. Uh, the metric dictated by symmetry is a hyperbolic metric. If you parametrize the hyperboloid in the obvious way using hyperbolic analog of spherical coordinates, then you, you see your standard hyperbolic metric with a scale factor given by um, the, density, the local density of states. However, on, if you are on the light cone, you need to use different coordinates, light cone coordinates, and the, the Important thing that happens is that the fact, so rho goes to zero, the metric degenerate, degenerates the geodesic along a light ray. Um, so the geodesic distance, so we know this from special relativity, the geodesics, geodesic distance along a light ray is zero. Yeah? No time passes for a photon traveling at the speed of light. So this becomes zero. Um, this one survives because you can, uh, you can do a scaling or you want to do a scaling that keeps this one fixed. So once you understand this, you understand a lot. Um, small density of states takes you to the light cone. Um, the metric does something new. And the consequence is a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, notice that this orbit has the same dimension. Yeah? It's, it's um, just a, a limit of this hyperboloid. Um, but what I claim happens for the integer quantum Hall transition is that the, you have spontaneous symmetry breaking, the field localizes along a light ray. Why? Well, along these directions, the field is very mobile. So zero is not strictly zero. There's something fighting against, so the vesumino witten term, to be, to be precise, fights and uh, supports, so it prevents the flow from falling into zero. So something 
supports um, this term, keeps it away from zero, but because the invariance puts a factor between these that goes to infinity, the, the stiffness constant in front of this one goes to infinity. So you have, you have mobility along a light ray and you have a moment of inertia, mass going to infinity, transverse to it. So that is the scenario for spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay, two slides on the conformal field theory that I proposed. So I spent an effort to explain that there is a novel mechanism of spontaneous symmetry breaking. The field gets stuck on a light ray. <clears throat> what is that light ray? Well, it's the target space of a vesomino witten model. It's a shear RR n comma gamma vesomino witten model. Here is the formula for the action. Uh, n is the level. It turns out to be four for, <clears throat> to get to reproduce the phenomenology of the transition. Uh, there is a marginal deformation parameter, which needs to be set to one to reproduce the phenomenology. Um, what do I mean by GLRR? Well, I don't mean exactly what <clears throat> many authors in the literature mean. Um, I don't mean a Lee supergroup target. <clears throat> I mean, a Riemannian symmetric superspace of type AA. And that is to say the following, we can set the Grassmann variables or the fermion fields to zero um, for fun. And then what we get is the so-called base manifold of the super manifold target. And that is a direct product of the positive Hermitian matrices with the unitary matrices. <clears throat> uh, a Lee supergroup target would have two factors U of R. Yeah? So notice first factor is not a unitary group. It is the non-compact dual. It's the positive Hermitian matrices. So of course the CFT is non-unitary. Uh, can't be any, any uh, other way. The vesomino witten field, M, has scaling dimension zero. Remember that Ilya argued that there had to be a field in the zero, there had to be a field in the theory of scaling dimension zero. <clears throat> then uh, Slava asks, well, how do you know that your field is not just the identity or equivalent to the identity anytime it appears under in the correlation function un under the functional integral? Well, here's the answer. It is not the identity. The, the, uh, the field that is needed by phenomenology is the vesomino witten field. Um, Can you remind Martin, what is the phenomenological interpretation of this field M? Because we went through quite a few steps at this point. So I kind of lost track with the original yeah, well, fields. Of course, the short answer is that it's the, the local density of states, so uh, or the Green's function, raised to the first power. But in, in general, we want to raise, and, and then um, this thing is silly. And, and one manifestation of that is if you just take the expectation of M, you're just going to get uh, one trivially. But we, are going to take powers of this. And these powers are not just trivially one, they give interesting information, correlation functions, multifactor exponents. <clears throat> yeah, so when M is raised, when M appears as just M, not put in some representation or some power, it's just the local density of states whose disorder average in the symmetry class we're talking about is, is trivial. It doesn't do anything at the transition. Okay, <clears throat> disclaimer, there is no first principle derivation of this, but I believe it's correct because uh, this theory predicts quite a few things and 
uh, it matches all the observations. So since this is frightening to a newcomer, and um, I now write explicit expressions for r equal to one. I warned you that <clears throat> that's what I'm going to do. So for r equal to one, we have GL11 or the Riemannian super symmetric superspace, and M is a two by two matrix. Um, there is a positive real number, which we parameterize as e to the phi. There's a unitary number, which we parameterize as e to the i theta. And then there's many ways of putting the fermions. One of them is by a Gauss decomposition, lower triangular, upular triangular. So eta and xi are the two fermion fields in this theory. Uh, you then write an expression for the invariant metric given here. From that, you derive the invariant super integration form. Um, you notice that, so important, uh, important feature, the, uh, if you had a least supergroup target, so many people study least supergroup targets, um, one of the facts of life there is that the volume of a least supergroup is zero. So you don't have a good normalization integral. Normalization is zero. Um, we don't have this problem here. The volume is one. The normalization integral is one. Let me spend, although I'm, I'm running short of time, this is important. Let me spend a minute or two on this. <clears throat> So that story relates to this feature, namely that the non-compact sector, which here is the positive half axis, and the compact, the fermion-fermion sector, they intersect in a single point. That's crucial. Why? <clears throat> well, we have a super algebra with, in our case, two generators, two R generators. These generators are expressed as, or they give rise to killing vector fields. No, they, they, they are in the symmetry algebra. So there are two odd killing vector fields. These killing vector fields come represent generators that, that mix bosons and fermions. And they have a zero at such points of intersection. So it's very important this, that there is only one point of intersection. So the, the odd killing vector fields have vanished only at one point. That is behind this property. So you have a there's something called supersymmetric localization theorems sort of a, a variant of Deutsch-Tamat Heckmann, um, because there's only one point here. You localize on that one point and, and you get one. Now compare this to a least supergroup target. Um, for example, GL11 where you, or U1 slash one, where you have U1 and again U1. Then you have all, everybody is a point of intersection. So your odd killing vector field vanishes all over the place. And that causes some problems. In particular, it causes the volume to be zero. And moreover, it causes the appearance of indecomposable representations. If you try to decompose the function space on a least supergroup, then you, you get all, so I guess all, <laughs> There are many, many indecomposable representations. You can ask Volker Schumeros, he will tell you everything about it. Um, not so here. Um, there's almost no indecomposable representation. Um, there's just one in a sense. <clears throat> um, all right. That was an excursion, but I think that was, uh, Important. So in, in this parameterization, 
the action now has an expression which should not look so frightening. Uh, it's quadratic in, in phi and theta. It is still interacting because they have this factor here. This is the deformation. There's something nice you can do because the action is quadratic in the fermions, you can integrate them out. And then you wind up with something that strikes you as just Gaussian free field with background charge. So, um, so I'm putting this slide to, um, to convey the message that it may look frightening, but actually, um, it's rather nice. And in a nutshell, I would just declare my mantra that this theory and its analogs, they really do their best job. They really try very hard to be unitary. They, they can't be unitary. They must be non-unitary. But they try their very best job to be as unitary as possible. Don't quite succeed. Um, so that's an important message. Now uh, I'm out of time, but if you give me <laughs> five or 10 extra minutes, uh, then I can go through the final three slides, which I uh, think are important. The sort of the talk has been building up um, to this. So what are the pros prospects for conformal bootstrap? Well, we need to rethink a little bit. <clears throat> the challenge is that the correlators that you would write down make no sense here. The, the issue is that, <clears throat> um, so here I'm appealing to um, the fact that we like to use either path integral or the operator formalism to do things. So I here write something in operator formalism. The, um, if we try to do such a thing in our case, what hits us is that the, the vacuum of the theory is not L2, neither is it L1, nor is it LP, is none of these things. The vacuum, or the zero mode, is the constant function on a hyperboloid, which you can't integrate. That's the main problem. Um, that problem is regulated by epsilon. Yeah, so epsilon helps to control that integral, but we need to send epsilon to zero. Epsilon breaks conformal invariance. Uh, we want to get rid of epsilon. As we get rid of epsilon, our vacuum, uh, <clears throat> at least in the symmetry unbroken phase, approaches constant the constant on the hyperboloid. So we are blown. Things like this don't exist. Ilya talked about puzzles that arise from thinking along these lines in a too naive way. To get a, a workable system, we need to adapt the framework. How can we get inspired? <clears throat> well, we can look at the theory of distributions. Laurent Schwartz told us that we should not take an L2 function and another L2 function and integrate one against the other. We should think of some very good functions, very smooth and maybe with compact support. Then if we do that, we buy ourselves a lot of freedom to generalize the function here. It could have non-compact support, it could have atoms, it could be highly non-smooth. There's a trade-off. <clears throat> Go away from L2 times L2. Choose something good here, and then you're allowed to choose something bad there. So how does this, how does this translate to our case? So the idea, main for this idea is contained in, in some paper with Bondes, Roberto Bondesan and Vichorek of some years ago. And um, while that paper was written explicitly in the integer quantum all context, here I, I have distilled for you the essential features of the idea. The idea is that there is a way to get rid of epsilon, which I call a point contact. 
So here on the left, you should think as a critical lattice model, maybe it has doubly periodic boundary conditions, so we can draw it as a torus. And now somewhere in that rectangular system with double periodic boundary conditions, we put a point contact. That means we attach a link that allows us to feed in flux into the 2D system. At the same time, we attach a link that allows flux to come out. And these are positioned nearby in space. In the network model, we just open a single link. We call that a point contact. Uh, I'm sorry, flux of what? Electronic flux. Yeah, so we have okay. electrons or particles moving around here on the lattice. Yeah? And um, you, many people like to think about the closed system and then diagonalize a Dirac operator or a Schrodinger operator or some, some wave operator for quantum mechanics on that lattice. Um, the, pro the, the spectrum will be discrete and the and normalization of the wave function will bring in the system size and will do a lot of things that you don't want and that at least I don't want. And so I get rid of these unwanted things by doing something different. Um, instead of working with a closed system and a discrete spectrum, I go to the scattering type of situation. Um, so I feed in a unit of flux and then that flux, and then I solve the Schrodinger Dirac equation or whatever it is in here. And the solution will output some reflection amplitude. So I just solve the wave equation with incoming wave boundary conditions. One advantage is that I'm in charge. I can say what the energy is. I can say that the energy is zero. That's very important for systems in symmetry classes where the critical behavior is at zero energy. I can choose to sit exactly at the critical point. Um, that's something that people working with closed systems can't do. They have to sort of trust their luck that the randomness is just such that they're by chance, there is a critical wave function at zero energy. Typically, it will not be. They will be out of luck. They won't have a, crit a truly critical wave function. So it becomes a discussion of, is this important or not? You have to estimate scales compared with the system size. I get rid of all of this by putting myself in charge of this, uh, the game and manufacturing eigenfunctions of the energy that I want. And that could be zero energy. Now. If the system is in a localized phase, that wave function will be localized near the point contact. It will not go all over the place. Anderson localization will localize it to the vicinity of where it is made. Yeah. So it's clear that if I choose the system large enough, my wave function forgets the system size. Yeah. So listen, that's extremely important. We are forgetting the system size. <clears throat> That's crucial. As we approach the critical point, the localized wave function will get bigger and bigger. That's critical. Um, so the, uh, the, the issue of system size becomes less obvious, but <clears throat> I expect it to be good. So what can we do with this wave function? Well, we can think of some functional that probes it. So I call the wave function psi sub c because it's made in, in the way I described by the insertion of the point contact. And then there's a translation that's called the continuum limit for the critical system to a CFT where the point contact is represented by a specific operator and then these functionals by corresponding operators. And of course the expectation of the with respect to the disorder left hand side should be the field theory expectation on the right hand side, where the point contact is represented here by a special operator called the point of point contact operator. So example, integer quantum all case, one replica. Um, we can probe 
So if we want to do fancy things, we need to do bigger R, but we can already do something quite interesting for R equal to one. We can get the uh, multifractality spectrum. We can do something else. Uh, let me skip that because I'm really running over, over time. Um, the dictionary here is that um, this functional of the wave function translates into this uh, operator. So that's a matrix element. Let's go back two slides. Um, so remember, in the vesomino witten field, uh, in some decomposition, there is e to the phi. So that's what I'm talking about. There's also this guy. I won't talk about it much. Um, so a certain matrix element of vesomino witten field is what you get on the other side of this dictionary. There's a spectrum of primary fields. <clears throat> uh, you need to, for completeness, you need to have both of them. Uh, there are quantum numbers. Q needs to vary through something parallel to the imaginary axis. P, this one, because this is a, a compact sector, P has to be an integer. And um, notice that these scaling dimensions are all positive. You should like that. Yeah? If you're worried about non-unitarity and, and all hell that could break loose, um, don't worry. These scaling dimensions are all positive, um, at least in the case of interest for the integer quantum wall transition. And then very importantly, there's a completeness property. The, uh, this point contact operator, which must be must be there in any correlation function for it to make sense, uh, is in quotes something like the Dirac delta distribution on the target localized identity, and that has a Fourier expansion in terms of these fields. Uh, I forgot to put the identity. Yeah, so. The, the spectrum is this plus the identity operator. So I'm really running late, but this is my last slide. Quick comparison with quantum Liouville theory. In Liouville theory, you have a good three-point function. Um, using operator language, you have a vertex field operator. Let's take three of them for the three-point function. Very schematic notation, but similar symbols. <clears throat> The three-point function in quantum Liouville theory exists. It even exists for the mathematicians, someone like Antikupiainen and company. They will tell you that they can prove this. <clears throat> they can prove the dots formula and Don Otto Samologikov and Samologikov formula. Uh, the three-point function exists. Why does it exist? Well, the zero mode integral is well behaved um, from the background charge or the uh, sort of the integration measure, you have an e to the plus phi. And then from the vertex operators on, on the good spectral line, you get three times minus a half. Yeah, so plus one minus three times a half is minus a half. So that integral we are worried about plus infinity converges. Whereas in our case, it's just the other way around. And so the difference from Liouville theory to our case is that there's a shift due to the presence of the fermions, the, the root system changes and the, the half sum of the positive roots goes from plus one to minus one. So this plus becomes minus these minuses become plus, and now we have minus one plus three times a half, plus three halves is plus a half, the integral does not exist. So that's that's the difference. While in Liouville theory, you have a, a three-point function which exists even for the mathematicians. In our case, the three-point function does not exist unless you, take one of these operators to be a point contact. Now, when you do that, you have 
a good two-point function. Yes. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is that any endpoint function has to include one point contact. It could have several. You could have an absorbing boundary if you want to make your life more difficult. But if you want to have a simple life, the simplest thing you can do is insert a single point contact. Then these correlation functions are well behaved and you get a good two point function and you get a good three point function. I'm really out of time. So here, summary outlook. What are the main messages? <clears throat> well, you need to be aware of the distinction between systems with small versus large density of states. If you're going to do um, conformal bootstrap of Anderson transitions, you first have to think and to decide whether you join the camp of the nonlinear sigma model or a, a new camp that might be forming. Um, The issue of upper critical dimension needs to be revisited, I believe. It's not clear to me that for the case I've been focusing on, <clears throat> namely the CFT of the integer quantum hole transition and, and a similar scenario that you might now try to describe to three and higher dimension, it's not clear to me that you don't have an upper critical dimension. It's possible that there might be one. In fact, there's something called the fallhard wolfle self-consistent theory of Anderson localization, which does give you an upper critical dimension. But then a major message was to, to do conformal bootstrap of Anderson transitions, you will need a slight adaptation of the framework. You need to... Um, take seriously the features of that are forced on you by hyperbolic symmetry, which <clears throat> initially is this epsilon regularization, but you, you, you don't like this epsilon regularization. It breaks conformal symmetry, so you want to get rid of it, have to do something. And what I suggest to do is to insert point contacts. Then you have good two-point function, good three-point function, good four-point function. By the way, the four-point function with one point contact is what Bondesan, Wicherich, and I used to prove the para parabolicity of the multifractal spectrum that Ilya mentioned in his Tuesday talk. This, that four-point function has one point contact in it. And so I expect everything to be fine uh, so that the four point function obeys crossing symmetry. And um, so we can talk about conformal blocks. Um, um, but a point contact always is involved. And we should not freak out about this because point contact by completeness has a Fourier expansion in terms of the primary fields. You should think that the, um, the point contact is a bump. Yeah, it's a smooth, it's a Dirac delta smeared out. And you can fully analyze that bump in terms of the uh, constant function. That's a little bit peculiar, but it's understood. And all these um, well-behaved, uh, primaries, well, they have in the sense that they have a positive scaling dimension. Sorry for running so late. Um, I hope um, that I talked some sense. And anyway, my my my, uh, my goal was to clarify some things and um, draw your attention up point your attention to things that I feel are really important and that need to be sorted out and understood before one can seriously talk about bootstrapping Anderson transitions. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for this uh, beautiful talk. I think we have a lot of food for thought. Um, since we are already 20 minutes over time, maybe there are some short questions. 
Can I why, uh, why ask, ask about the um, free per the parameters which were fixed, the n and gamma? The question is? So you had these parameters n and gamma, which you said you fixed phenomenologically. So yes. in principle, following the logic you described, could you simply derive them? Yes, um, we should be able to derive them. Um, I have fragments of a derivation. Um, but to be honest, um, it's not complete. Uh, it's, it's getting better and better. So I hope within the next year or so, there will be a derivation from basic principles. So the derivation will start from the Chalker Coddington network model. And um, it should derive this, including the value of N and the value of gamma. At the moment, I'm taking the phenomenological approach of arguing, make, making a long argument that this is the right theory, and then fixing the parameters, um, fixing the parameters by matching. So these things can be measured in, in numerics. Yeah, so in particular, the multifractality spectrum can be measured. And this prefactor in the old days was zero point. So Chaka uh, had 0 0.269 and then later Arthur's had 0 0.263. And um, uh, the, the better your numerics is, so the better you control the finite size scaling, the closer you get to 0 0.25. So since n has to be an integer, being the level of a, of a, of a current algebra, I concluded that n is 4. That's the only integer compatible with 1 over n being 0 0.25. And then if this term was present, it would screw up things. So we conclude gamma has to be 1. Okay, maybe Ilya should ask this question. Ilya, you need to turn on your microphone. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Martin. It was a very illuminating talk and I really enjoyed it. So, but I have a lot of questions. I'm not sure how long we can stay here, but let me start by asking something simple. So why do you restrict Q to be on this uh, line? I mean, Practically speaking, you can raise your wave function to any power, right? Not necessarily one half plus an imaginary thing. And then you're out of your spectrum. But the multifractal spectrum is defined for those values and it can be negative, certainly. Right? So what's so how do you respond to that? Well, there are many ways to answer. Um, if you know something about Liouville theory, then you will appreciate something called Seiberg bounds. Yeah. Uh, so you, ha you have the analog of Q times one minus Q. Um, the Seiberg bounds give you the range between zero and one. And the middle of that is a half. And the, the good line is a half plus any imaginary increment. That's where, uh, that's where the harmonic analysis is. That's where the, the good Fourier um, spectrum lies. You, you may stretch the theory. You may take Q outside the Seiberg bound um, by analytic continuation. You know? So uh, physicists are not dumb, they, they try. <laughs> Anything, they will try anything that goes. But you see, if you talk to a mathematician, um, then they'll be hesitant and they, they will start working uh, 
inside the cyber bounds. And that's what I'm proposing to do. That's why you have good control. That's where things exist. No, 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 Martin. That's I, the backbone. Okay, I, I, I understand the it. backbone of okay. the theory. I understand but this. But, understood but the backbone practically of the theory, speaking, no, 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 no. Practically speaking, numerically, you can certainly measure these operators and these multifractal exponents outside of this interval. And that's perfectly fine. I mean, they're working. You can certainly do this numerically on the computer. You put these wave functions, you raise the arbitrary powers, you get some numbers out. So, I mean, yes. Want, How do so, these numbers depend on system size? You see, the outside that range, the is the 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 moment grows. Yeah. So in this right. in this case here that I'm speaking about, um, yeah. So you look at these wave function moments. I look at them at the at the distance from the point contact, and when I stay within the cyber bounds, it nicely decays. If I go outside, this moment grows. <clears throat> so um, the uh, there is an issue with system size. There is an infrared problem for them. Um, you may choose to ignore it, but if you look at the fine details, if you try to prove something, you'll discover that it it makes a difference. So you can get there by continuation, but I it's not where. I want to start. I want to start there where there is control. Where and that happens to be the regime where the scaling dimensions are positive and where the theory is as close to unitarity as it could possibly be. All right. Okay, I got this. So but nevertheless, in this formula where you're hiding, where you're highlighting it now. So there's no system size because you devised it in a way that the point contact actually, you know, takes care of the charge neutrality. So there's no system size involved here. Exactly. So where is the problem? So suppose this dimension were negative. Why would that be a problem? There's no system size, right? Well, the correlator is if I take Q outside. So below zero or above one on the real axis, um, that correlation function grows. Yeah, and I mean, so what? So what? I mean, again, we're not talking so about my, you know. My, I'm my talking system, about the critical. Yeah. Okay. My system is never in reality. My system is never going to be infinite. I somehow want to ensure that the, the things that I look at behave in finite size as if we were in infinite size, yeah? where the difference between finite size and infinite size doesn't matter. That is the case for correlators that decay. Yeah? Because by the time I reach the, uh, the system size, which in practice can never be infinite, it has gone down to such a small value that I can ignore it. So that, that's the practical point of view. By the way, since um, you keep asking about this, the mathematicians know something called the eisenmann molchanov fractional moment method. Do you know what that is? I think I do, yeah. It's just that. It works with the green function for Q between zero and one, not outside, not for Q less than one and not for Q bigger than one. What Eisenmann and Molchanov do in their fractional moment method for Anderson localization is they study the Green's function of this object for Q between zero and one. And they discover that the best place to look is at a half. Well, so there's a lot of reasons for this. I, I didn't yeah, but make I this up. Uh, it's not my invention. Uh, this is just, uh, this is a rule of the game and we should, the faster we appreciate this rule of the game, the faster progress will be in the future. No, no, I, I, I think I would make a stronger claim is that there are other correlators, uh, multifractal type, which are not described by field theory. That's a very simple out because, you know, field theory restricts too much. I mean, there are correlators that are yeah. perfectly 
measurable, sure. but not but consistent no, with anything. But listen, Elio, we're talking to filters. We're talking yes, to I know. formal bootstrappers. Yeah. We should tell them a story that they can do something with. You should not confuse them with all kinds of other things on our agenda that they will never be able to deal with. So, okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I have a small question, if I may ask. Um, yeah, here you, you're dealing with a theory with a parameter r equals one, but then you, you have other values of this parameter. So are the other values also interesting? Certainly, if you, if you wish to study more correlated. So here it's a little bit limit, limited. Um, in this R to one theory, what we can probe, so on the left hand side, you see possible observables in the lattice model. No? Um, this one somehow is the totally symmetric representation. So there's, there's a how dual, something that's acting on the lattice um, and how dual, if, if you know what that means. Um, this is the totally symmetric representation of the how dual, and this is the totally anti-symmetric representation. More generally, you'd like to, um, you can think of the symmetric group um, to keep it simple. If you want to have mixed representations, not totally symmetric or totally anti-symmetric, um, then R equals one is not enough. You need to go to R equal two, R equal three, you will be able to find the corresponding operators. Um, I would advertise a paper written by Ilya Grusberg, Sasha Mirlin, and myself in PRB some time ago, where this dictionary um, is sketched. You can get, get inspired. Of course, there we don't talk about the conformal fit theory, but that dictionary is rather universal. What to expect on the field theory side doesn't depend too much on these details. So yeah, if you want to have more subtle, more <clears throat> refined correlation functions, probing uh, more points in space and other symmetries of, of this way, <clears throat> other representations of this, you need to go to higher R and that's in principle possible. And I assume it will be done in the future um, as a pioneer and um, struggling to get answers quick, I have to confess that many of the calculations I've done have been just for R equal to one. That's a fact of life. I would like also to ask a question. You might, it's possible that you get away because you have the retarded and advanced uh, Green's function. So effectively, maybe you have a something like two replicas, but in my business and the classical systems, if you just have one copy of the system, you don't even see the renormalization of the disorder. So you don't really know about this, this aspect of your theory. Yeah, I understand what you say. There, there are related systems like ones that you mentioned where going to aisle to one just makes things trivial. There's nothing to learn from that case, not so here. Yeah, and, and it's for the reason that you already said, um, we have bosons and fermions and we have retarded and advanced. So we have four field copies and there's enough structure in, the, in these four field copies uh, in order to detect certain information. It's the one shown here. Now, if you will, um, and in particular, it's enough to see uh, what the renormalization group is doing. Okay. Are there more questions?
Well, if not, then uh, let's thank Martin for this uh, very nice uh, seminar again. Um, Sylvain, can you stop the recording because I'm not host? And I propose we give a, us at least 10 minutes uh, before Slava continues. Slava, what do you think? <laughs> 